Welcome to Grace and Truth with Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a devotion that's meant to encourage you and challenge you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Please subscribe to our podcast and check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Hi there, this is Pastor Sherman Burkhead, and this is Grace and Truth, a devotion that's meant to encourage you and challenge you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ uh, through a time in the Word and time in prayer. And it is a uh, uh, wonderful day outside. It actually, it's another nice day. The temperatures are still a little bit warm. We are in the middle of September, uh, but things are beginning to um, to cool off a little uh, a little bit. And uh, with that being said, I'm just trying to make sure I get set up here so that way I can kind of see your guys's uh, uh, your guys's comments and um, and make sure that we can say hello to one another. Um, so I'm always grateful to 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 interact with you guys live. Um, you know, especially appreciate the. Uh, um, you know, the prayer requests and the thoughts and the notes and stuff, all that stuff um, means a lot to me. But um, again, today's a really nice day. Good afternoon, Christy. Hope you're doing well. Uh, it is a another nice day outside. Again, it's uh, high 90s, but uh, hopefully soon it'll be cooling off. Um, uh, there's a lot, been a lot of construction going on in my house. I'm grateful for the fact that we can finally do some projects uh, around the, the, uh, my house here at the, at the parsonage. Um, but um, I'd be glad when some of that stuff's done. Uh, but that being said, I just want to take a quick moment and um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, we always begin grace and truth with the the understanding that there is a lot that, that God has done for us to be grateful. And I think that, that gratitude is an important spiritual discipline that we need to practice that helps us to, to not become complacent in our walk with God, but also it helps us to um, not become distracted from Him by all the things that are happening in the world around us. Again, one, if, if you've been following us on Sunday mornings, we've been going through Mark chapter 13, and one of the things that we see in the middle of Mark chapter 13 is the goal is really, really clear. The goal um, uh, for us as Christians is the evangelism of the world. You know, the, the gospel must be spread all the way around the world. And, you know, when you look at Mark chapter 13, you see there's a lot of things that are going on um, that Jesus talks about, you know, uh, wars and famines and, and persecution. And those things have a tendency to take our eyes and our minds off of um, the mission that God has given us. And I think gratitude, I think, helps to sharpen our minds and helps us to kind of refocus our, our attention and refocus our hearts and um, um you know, back to the to, to the mission, right? Because the reality is, is no matter how bad things are, no matter how bad your life is, and or, or, or how how difficult uh, things have become for you, um, the truth is this: God has still done many many things for you. You have many things to be grateful for. The fact that the very next breath you take is a gift by His hand. The fact that you woke up this morning alive is another gift by His hand. If you are somebody who who is pain-free today, then that's a gift by his hand. If you have pain, but you're still able to operate and live, you know, God is still giving you a gracious gift. If your family members are alive and well today, that is a gift from his hand, right? If food tastes good in your mouth, that is another gift. And I say that to say is my brother, um, uh, Troy, he actually fell and bumped his head really hard. And he's done that many times in his life, but he fell and bumped his head really hard several years back and he lost the sense of smell um, because of it. It's just never come back. Uh, and there might be occasions where that might be a blessing. But the fact of the matter is, is I don't know about you, but the smell of food is a blessing to me. When I, when I smell, you know, like steak cooking or, you know, apple pie and things like that. Even something as simple as our senses is is something to be grateful for. And it doesn't take very long to look around that there are people who don't have some of the things that you do have. And so no matter how hard life is for you, no matter how difficult things are for you, you have very, very, very much to be grateful to God for. And I am... um, I am super grateful. And uh, yes, Wilson is uh, joining us live as well. Uh, Good to see you, Wilson. Uh, Praying for you guys as always. Uh, Very grateful for the work you're doing there in Kenya. Um, in fact, I'm, you know, Wilson's one of the people I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the work he's doing. I'm grateful for the evangelism that they're pursuing there in Kenya in their, uh, their, in their neighborhood. They're traveling as much as six miles in a day, you know, sharing the hope of Christ. Uh, and people are coming to faith in Christ uh, because of their work. And so, again, I'm grateful for them. But I just wanted to say uh, one of the things I'm grateful for um, is I'm just grateful for the gift of family. And I'm, t- and I'm speaking in a sense generically, but the fact of the matter is, is if you have parents that, that are still alive, right, then, then, then you know what I'm talking about. And if you have parents that you've lost, you also understand what I'm talking about. But the point being is, 
you know, our parents aren't always going to be with us, right? But it's also the same thing with our kids. It's, you know, same thing with cousins. I have cousins that are important and, you know, and dear to me. The fact that God has just knitted us together as social people, um, uh, the, the fact that God has knit us together as social people, um, that we, we're built for relationships with other people, and that we're built to live in these little communities known as families, um, just says a lot about who he is, but his grace. Um, the fact of the matter is, is you can have a parent that you can lean on in tough times, and you have the joy of having children uh, and the blessing that comes with that. Um, the joy of a spouse, the, the, com the, the companionship of a brother, the, the deep friendship of a, of a good cousin you, you share you, you know, many memories with. There's lots and lots of dynamics in, in family relationships. I'm just grateful to God for that. I'm just grateful for you know, my, my brother and you know, my sister. I'm grateful uh, to God for my, for my dad and mom. I'm grateful to God for my kids. And I really am especially grateful to God for my grandkids. Uh, I, I, you know, I have a special kind of affection for them that God has put in my heart. I guess it's just a grandparent's kind of love. So with that being said, we all have multiple things in our lives that we can be grateful for. And I'm hoping that you today can find something in your life to be grateful for. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter how hard things are, I promise you, if you really think about it, there's something in your life that you can look to, to heaven and say, Lord, I'm grateful to you for this today. And by the way, I love to hear from you about those things. I love it when you send me those uh, notes about you know what God's made you grateful for. You can message me at uh, uh, here on Facebook, or you can email me at fbcborn at gmail.com, or you can call me at 760-762-5149. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And if you have questions about God, if you have questions about faith, if you have questions about theology, if you have questions about, hey, how can I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk with you about this. Again, I'm here to have that conversation and, and kind of point you in the right direction and help you to examine the scriptures for yourself. But uh, uh, that being said, um, that's what I am grateful for, and I'm hopefully that you know you have much to be grateful for as well. Uh, but I want to turn your attention again back to our text, um, and it's the same text as we were in last week, but um, but it still goes to the same subject that the subject I want to talk about today. And so it's Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 28, and we're going to read 28 to 30, and it reads this way. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn of many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now today what we're doing is we're continuing our mini-series here um, on grace and truth about the doctrine of salvation. And it comes from that word glorified. There's a promise uh, in the Word of God that at one point in our lives that we will be glorified. Well, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, that actually relates to the doctrine of salvation. And that's what we've been talking about, the doctrine of salvation. One of the most important doctrines in all of Christianity is the truth about salvation and how God actually saves us. And this miniseries is actually inspired from Wilson, uh, who had a question about salvation, wanted some more about teach, wanted to know uh, more teaching about the subject. And so uh, we've been answering that. But uh, this is an opportunity for us to really kind of reflect on this important doctrine. And we began this series by exploring what salvation actually is and what it is that we're being saved from. I know a lot of people talk about being saved. We hear people, you know, talk about, you know, well, Jesus saved me from my sins. But what does that actually mean? Well, the doctrine of salvation, the short definition I think would, that, that it bears memorizing is salvation is a gracious act of God where he saves us from our sin and from his wrath and then reconciles us and then reconciles us into a relationship with him through the finished through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Um, salvation is a gracious act of God where he saves us from our sin and from his wrath and then reconciles us in our relationship to him through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the short definition. In essence, what salvation is, is the truth that God created us for a relationship with him. But sin, our sin, separated us from him. It destroyed the relationship we were designed to have with him. And because of that, God's wrath and his judgment abides on us. 
right? We are in rebellion to God. One of these days, God is going to punish us for that rebellion. His wrath will be poured out on us when we face him at some point. And guess what? We will all face him because we will all die, right? And so his judgment will be poured out on us when we face him unless something changes. But the bad news for us is there's not anything we can do on our own to overcome the stain of our sin. We can't make ourselves right with God. We can't you know, create a peace accord with God by what we can do. And so in essence, we are hopeless. But then the good news is God, the Father, sent God the Son into the world to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus Christ lived the life that we couldn't live and died on the cross to make payment for our sins. And then he rose three days later, proving that that payment had been satisfied. And the benefits of Christ's work are granted to us, not because we do good things for God, but only through faith and repentance, that we repent and believe the gospel. That is the essence of what it means, what salvation is. It's what it means to be saved. It's what we're saved from. But as we've been talking about, salvation isn't just some one-time event that happens in the past that we look back on and then, you know, and then that's it, right? This salvation is actually much bigger than that. Salvation encompasses our entire existence. It encompasses our, our past. It encompasses our present. It encompasses our future. And it also encompasses a complete change in our very nature. We're fundamentally changed when we are saved. You see, when it comes to salvation, there's the idea of regeneration, which is that we are made spiritually alive by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what we're going to talk about next week. And then there's justification, where we are made a we're, we're, justification where God declares us righteous, not because of what we've done, but by the by by righteous by Christ's righteousness, right? And that we are that He saves us from the penalty of our sin. He declares us righteous and saves us from our sin. Our sins have been taken care of by Christ. All of our sins are forgiven, and we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which is what we talked about two weeks ago. And then there's sanctification. Sanctification is where God is progressively at work inside of us, saving us from the power of sin. This is the present tense, you know, ongoing work of God the Holy Spirit, what he's doing inside us, making us more and more holy. This is where God is changing us or conforming us actively into the image of Christ. The person that you are today, you won't be two years from now. If you're a Christian for any length of time, you recognize there's something that's happened in you. You've been changed over time. This is the work that's ongoing until we step off into eternity. And we talked about that last week. But then there's glorification, where one day we will ultimately finally be with God in his presence forever, and we will be perfected, and we will be saved from the presence of sin. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is glorification. Sounds like a weird, strange word, you know, because the reality is, is I think sometimes I even struggle to even talk about glorification because I don't even want to think about my own personal glory, right? The fact of the matter is, is as far as I understand, God created the entire universe and the world for his glory. He does everything he does for his glory. Everything that happens in my life, whether it's good or bad, is ultimately for my good because I believe in God and trust him and love him, but ultimately it's for his glory, and that I should never live for my own glory, but for his own glory. But then there's a promise that one day that we will be glorified. Right? That's such a strange kind of notion. What does that mean? What is glorification? Well, the simple definition would be this. Glorification, glorification deals with um, the ultimate perfection of believers. That's a simple, simple definition, right? If you want to just kind of like summarize it down to one little statement, glorification deals with the ultimate perfection of believers. This is where God's work, that ongoing sanctifying work in us is finally completed. Another definition, uh, gotquestions.org uh, actually, I think, provided this definition, said that glorification is, an, is God's final removal of sin from the life of the believer in the eternal state. Right? That's what it means to be perfected, by the way. It means that basically sin's gone. The influence of sin is completely removed from our lives in every possible manner. Right? It's removed from our hearts, so sin doesn't like entice us to do things. It's removed from our minds so that we don't so we can actually think clearly and rationally without, you know, the the mind altering influence of sin. Uh, sin's been removed from our bodies, which means we don't get broke down anymore. We don't uh, we don't get wore out. We don't have disease. We don't have you know we don't have infirmities. All of our joints always feel perfect. 
right? Sin's been removed from influence from our body. By the way, I know a lot of people um, in my life who, who would love just to have that right there, just to where their body didn't hurt anymore. And then, right, it's also when sin's been removed from our environment, right? Which means we're going to live in a state in heaven, right? What that and, and how that's defined, there's a, you know, there's a lot to talk about there as well. But really, when God sets all things right, we're going to live in an environment where sin has been removed completely. So it's not affecting us personally, and it's not affecting the world around us, right? And this is an amazing thought to think about, right? This is an amazing thought to, to, to get your head wrapped around, this idea of an existence where nothing in your life, nothing around your life, nothing remotely close to your life is affected by sin anymore. And this is a great definition, but I don't think it really can fully conveys the depths of glorification. Because the, glor the, the depths of glorification don't have its roots in the fact that sin is just missing. It has its roots in the fact that God is present. In fact, Desire and God writes this. Uh, in, in, in their website, uh, there's a little short article on what is glorification. And, and I just want you to see, I want you to hear this definition. It says, the Christian doctrine of glorification is stunning, they say, to say the least. Not only will we see Jesus in his new creation glory, but we will share with him in it. And then to validate what they're saying is they quote 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, and when he appears, we shall be like him because we will, shall see him as he is. What a marvelous, marvelous truth that is, right? Glorification is when finally all of God's redemptive work is completed and everything is completely perfect as God intended it to be. And we, and this is the amazing part, this is the part that should make you shout for joy. We have immediate, intimate relationship with God through Christ. The relationship that we were created for, the relationship that we get a sense of when we come to faith in him, that we feel his presence, we feel that longing within us to be closer to him, finally that's realized. Basically, glorification is when all of our hopes are completely satisfied and realized. Not only are we morally perfect and don't sin anymore, not only are we physically perfect but our, and our bodies don't break down anymore, not only are we, are we mentally perfect and, and all of our thinking is sharp and crisp and clear and we always think the right way, we will live in perfect joy and in perfect fellowship with God and perfect fellowship with other people as well. No more strife and no more bitterness or jealousy or anger. Just sheer perfect relationships with other people. We will behold God in all of his glory. Right? And we will live in a world that's itself glorious. Everything will be perfect as it was supposed to be. And we will live as perfect image bearers where we reflect the nature and the image of God in everything that we say and do because we're perfectly aligned with him, the way that we were created to be. And this is an existence that's beyond our imaginations, by the way. It's more than what we can even take in. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor what the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. You have no idea just how awesome and amazing this hope of glorification is all we do know is that we can we can describe it in ways that would give us a sense of it like in revelation chapter 21 verse 4 um, john writes he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away if you just take those things out of the world right there pain and mourning and crying and death. You take those things out of the world. How much more incredible and amazing is this world around us? Right? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. The idea that we will be in God's presence living in glory forever is just more than we can possibly imagine. But with that being said, we should not allow ourselves to just settle for we can't imagine that. Because we have indications or shadows of what that's going to be that should whet our appetites, that should sharpen our minds. You see, my kids, a couple of my youth group kids were in a discussion with somebody about LGBT issues, right? And the, 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 this, this person kept coming back at them, even though they were lovingly trying to show, share scriptures with, with this person. They just kept coming back and saying, but you know what? Am I not supposed to be happy? 
is it isn't life supposed to be about me being happy and the thing that, that this person couldn't understand is that happiness in this life right and satisfying base desires and satisfying urges right is such a short term thing to live for that you might satisfy those things momentarily but no one's happy forever in this life but those who are in Christ will experience joy forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Happiness here and now is too small of a thing to live for. But the joy of the Lord is something to live for forever. And let me just kind of just pique your interest and share just a couple of things that maybe might help shed some light on this. We all, you know, maybe we can't all understand what, what, the, what this glorification will be like, but we have pictures of it. If you've been to Yosemite, you know, I've never been. I've seen lots of pictures of it in lots of videos. But there are lots of people that tell me it's like the most beautiful place on the earth. And when you pull into that valley, it's a stunning, you know, just just amazing scene. Right. And what I want you to understand is when you walk or when you drive into Yosemite and your heart is filled with awe and wonder at the beauty of that creation, that is but the faintest light in the darkest of night of the reflection of the beauty of what glorification will be. You think about the most awe-inspiring beauty you've ever seen, and it's, it will pale in comparison as a flashlight will pale in comparison to the sun. That's the difference. The beauty we see here is but a dim reflection, and it should make our hearts long even more. I mean, let me share with you another kind of scenario. We all have loved ones. And we all have loved ones when we are around them. Our hearts are full and there's so much joy. And just hearing their voice lifts our spirits and hearing them laugh just makes us feel wonderful. Whether it's our children or grandchildren or parents, there are, there are people in your life that make you feel that way when you're around them. That just incredible sense of peace and satisfaction and joy. That satisfaction is but the faintest of twinkling starlights in the darkest of night of what the joy really will be when we are in Christ, in eternity, in our glorification. The joy that you feel is but a drop in the ocean of joy that you will experience when you're standing in the presence of Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's a joy, by the way, that won't get taken away from you. It won't be a joy that's stripped away from you by death or sickness or pain anymore. Can you not imagine that? That's why God has given me so many good gifts now, because it whets our appetites for the future. The good gifts he gives us today reminds us that he is there, and he loves us, and he is gracious, and he is all, he's calling us to repentance and faith in him. The taste of food is, again, a faint reflection of how wonderful heaven will be. The warmth of, of the sunlight on your skin after a cool morning is a faint reflection of the, the amazing radiance of, of God's presence. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Why? Because it's God saying, this is what eternity is going to be like forever and ever and ever and you can't even imagine what it's going to be like. That's what glorification is. And that's the promise, by the way, of all those who are in Christ. Because not only are you justified, past tense, have your sins been forgiven. And not only are you being sanctified in the moment that God is progressively changing the image of Christ. But that glorification is, you know, it says in Romans that they have been glorified. Right? In fact, let me just read the text for you one more time so you, so you hear it. Right? Because it's a promise that's, that's actually like it's been, been already taken care of. And for those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he, he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You see, the glorification that we await as Christians is set in stone. And nothing will take that away from us. It is the hope that we have. And this is why we can live the Christian life now. This is why we can stand up against persecution today. This is why we can rejoice in God's goodness right now. Is because we know that that hope is there and it's ours. It belongs to us. It's our inheritance and no one can ever take that away from us. The worst that anybody can do for us in this life is to strip away our material things and ultimately take our life. But ultimately, even then, they're going to be setting us free to be present with the Lord. Glorification is the final realization of all that Christ has accomplished for us. 
And I'm excited to continue to live here and do the work here, but there's part of me that's excited about that hope. As Paul says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Why? Because all of our hopes are fulfilled in the presence of Christ forever, and there will not be any more influence of sin. And I can talk about this forever and ever and ever and ever. My hope is that this truth inspires your heart. And so with that being said, let us wrap up this part of uh, our series and uh, let's pray. Uh, but my hope that is that your hope is inspired for, for the future, for, for, for the glorification that awaits you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. And I thank you for your love. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your hope. I thank you, Lord God, for the truth of what's awaiting us as Christians. That, Father, that you have set in stone, you have made clear that you have foreordained to save us and to reconcile us to you, Lord. That you sent Jesus Christ into the world to live the life we couldn't live, to die on the cross, to pay a penalty we couldn't pay. And then he rose from the dead, proving that it's been accomplished. It is, it's a historical fact that we can look back on and hold on to. And that when we repent and believe the gospel, we are immediately justified and we are immediately beginning the process of sanctification. But the, the hope of glorification is a set in stone reality that will never change, that awaits us. It is ours, Lord. Not because of what we've done, not because we deserve it, but because of your grace and you've promised it. And you always keep your promises, Lord. And Father, I look forward to the fulfillment of this promise. I look forward to the fulfillment of this promise to be forever in the presence of Christ with my family and those that I love. And I pray, Lord God, if people have not turned to you in repentance and faith, if they've not turned to you in hope today, Lord, that you would encourage them to do so. That you're not somebody up there just looking to just try to, you know, control people's actions for the sake of controlling their actions that you're saying, Lord God, I have done it. I have paid the penalty. Repent of your sins and turn to me. I have so much better for you, waiting for you. That I will forgive you of your sins. And more than my forgiving you of your sins, I will give you a hope that will last forever and ever and ever and ever. And I pray, Lord God, that it would motivate our hearts to turn to you in repentance and faith. That hope of eternity where there is no more pain or suffering, there is no more sorrow, there is no more death, that we have joy unending and perfect relationships with all those that we love, including you, Lord. And I pray, Father, you glorify yourself through that. And I pray, Father, for this country. I pray for this truth to create revival. I pray, Lord God, that evangelism would take place in every corner of the world. I pray, Lord God, that we would just continue to shout the name of Jesus and that we would exhort people to turn and believe, Lord, and that you would be glorified in our midst. And we pray, Father, for changed hearts and minds and that your word would produce the fruit that you have ordained for to produce and that you glorify yourself in and through our lives. And I pray for this nation. We pray, Lord God, for peace to reign. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bring repentance to our country and that we would one day be a light for the world. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that being said, I hope you know that you are loved and you are prayed for and you are deeply missed. And we look forward, um, hopefully, to seeing you guys soon. This coming Sunday... Uh, at 11 o'clock uh, here at First Baptist Church. You can um, you can visit with us here in the sanctuary or, or here live online. Also, um, if you get a chance, go out to the Boron Park this evening uh, from 4 to 8 o'clock. The Extreme Tour is out there um, and uh, going to be singing some songs and having some fun and meeting some people in the community and then hopefully being able to connect with people and sharing the hope of Christ uh, with all they come in contact with. And we're just praying um, people's hearts and minds are soft to the gospel and that they would get plugged in and uh, repent and believe what our country and our world needs more than anything else is Jesus Christ. I love you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Grace and peace. You've been listening to Grace and Truth with Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a ministry of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you consider partnering with us as we share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world?